thank you very much for coming today. I'm very excited to share with you today some insights on what is going on in Egypt. I know that many people in the US, perhaps yourselves include, included, are surprised and confused about what is going on in Egypt. It seems like the revolution three years ago came out of nowhere, right? Sending shockwaves around the world. And now, three and a half years later, it seems like the revolution is over. The military is back in power, and Islamist violence is erupting uh, almost on a daily basis, including yesterday's attack on a military installation in the Sinai that killed 29 uh, military officers. But today, actually, what I would like to suggest to you is that the revolution is not over, and that all of what we have witnessed in the past three and a half years, and indeed what we've witnessed before Tahrir Square, is all part of a much longer revolutionary process. To take the theme of the festival, Journeys, I'm proposing to you that revolution is a journey. It's a very long journey, one that takes many years uh, to unfold. And this is and will be the case in Egypt, just as it has been in other times and places throughout history. The revolution in Egypt, in fact, started well before 2011, as I'll discuss, and will continue for many years after. Revolutions have ebbs and flows. We know this from studying the history of revolutions in different times and places. Right now, we are definitely in an ebb. That is, the counter-revolution is very strong in Egypt right now. And when I speak about the counter-revolution, I speak about those state interests uh, that have an interest in persisting. If we think about a revolution as a, a forceful overthrow of a government or a, a radical change in a social system, then or social, political, and economic system, then we can look to those interests in that system to see where the sources of the counter-revolution come from. In Egypt, these are mainly three. The military, the state security forces and police, and the media. I'll be speaking a lot about the military and the state security forces today, a little less about the media, but I'd happy, be happy to address that in the Q&A. So these forces have been very successful in staging a counter-revolution since the events of Tahrir Square in 2011. But I'll show you that even in the midst of this counter-revolution, there are still attempts to change the system. And there are still utopic visions of Egyptian society that are circulating and that people act upon. And hence the title of my talk, Egypt's, uh, Egyptian Utopias, Revolution's Long Journey. What I'm going to suggest today is that these events that culminated in the protest of Tahrir Square in 2011 mean that there is no going back. There's no going back to a time before the revolutionary process. And this is for a few reasons. The first is that it's very difficult to suppress the memory of millions of people of this exhilarating experience of 18 days in 2011, when people were able to actualize their utopic visions of society in the actual spaces of protest. And when, at the end of that 18 days, they were actually able to enact what they thought was impossible, and that is the removal of a dictator who'd been in place for over 30 years. I'm suggesting that that memory of millions of people cannot be suppressed. Secondly, there's no going back because a large portion of those millions of people are members of the younger generation. The 18 to 35 year olds that constitute the demographic bulge in the Middle East, the most populous uh, demographic in Egypt. Students of generations and how generations form often talk about how they form around um, a, 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 an intense political and social experience at a particular time in one's life. We can think of the 60s generation here and how that formed around the unrest of the 1960s. The younger generation in Egypt has formed as a generation through the experience of these tumultuous times and of these protests, some of which have been successful. So they will carry that with them throughout their lives. So there's really no going back for them either. Thirdly, there's no going back because precedents have been set. The precedent that public space can be occupied by millions of people and that that occupation can have a result such as a removal of a long-standing president. 
So now Egyptians know what they need to do and what they are capable of should they wish, wish to uh, find a moment in which they can enact major change in the future. But most importantly, things can never go back because the main uh, demands of the revolution, the sources of discontent that led people to the streets in 2011 have not been addressed. And those sources of the revolution, of the discontent for the revolution, can be best encapsulated by revisiting the main slogan of Tahrir Square, of the revolution. This was bread, freedom, and social justice. Aish Horiyah Adel Ismaiyah, rhymes in Arabic. This was the main slogan that one started to hear in the years leading up to 2011, that was shouted uh, by millions in the squares across Egypt, not just in Tahrir Square, and that continues today to be a, a, a kind of a locus, a verbal locus of revolutionary demands and utopic visions. Bread. This is, signifies the, the, the belief among Egyptians that they have a right to the basic necessities of life, food, shelter, and safety. And food is very important here because food prices have been rising over the past 30 years while wages have remained stagnant. And there literally is a problem for nearly 50% of the population in putting bread on the table. Secondly, freedom. Now here we think about, okay, freedom to elect a president, right? That's what they were protesting for. It's not just that, it's also freedom to elect a parliament, but also freedom from state violence. The right to not have the state arbitrarily arrest you, imprison you, torture you in prisons or in, um, in military barracks, or to kill you. So that's a basic freedom they were fighting for. Freedom of expression, freedom of the press, as well as freedom of association, the right to form groups in civil society to enact social change. And finally, social justice, referring to the belief that all people in society should have access to the resources necessary to make a good life. Not as it is in Egypt that uh, the wealthy get what they want, are above the law, or that those in the military or the police get what they want and are above the law, but that everyone regardless of their social background, has a right to uh, a kind of upward mobility. So as I said, these three themes were encapsulated in the slogan in Tahrir. But the revolution started a long time before Tahrir Square, and any close observer of Egypt could have seen it coming. Could have seen it coming if they'd really paid attention back a few decades. In 1977, perhaps, there were bread riots in January of 1977. Why? President Anwar Sadat at the time decided to lift the state subsidies on bread for the poor. Poor people had been acquiring their bread for lower prices. Uh, the state had been subsidizing it. He did this in response to demands from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, it said he had to lift these subsidies in order to secure a loan from them to pay back Egypt's debts. He did so. Hundreds of thousands of people went to the streets, and within two days, he had to replace the subsidies. So even at this moment, you can see a revolutionary activity, an idea that we need basic rights to our daily bread being enacted on the streets and people were successful. If we fast forward to the early 2000s and we look at the labor movements, between 2006 and 2011, there were over 3,000 strikes. That's a huge number. This is before Tahrir Square. Uh, people in the labor movement were striking for basically a raise, a, a raise in minimum wage, which was despicably low, you couldn't really live on it, um, for, for fair wages, for workplace protections, for hazards in the workplace, as well as um, the, the right to have a, a, a permanent work contract, because the state had been moving towards a system of, akin to what we have here as temps, you know, hiring temps. So there were protests all across the country in all sorts of sectors, from 2006 to 2011. Also, before Tahrir Square, we saw the formation of political and social groups uh, gearing towards those aims of bread, freedom, and social justice. Two of the most important were the Kafeya movement, founded in 2004, and the April 6th movement, founded in 2008. The Kafeya movement, <laughs> Kafeya means enough in Arabic, and that was a group of uh, activists who formed to, together to say enough to hereditary succession and 30 plus years of presidency. This was at a time when Mubarak, there was discussion that 
President Mubarak was grooming his, his son, Gamal Mubarak, for the presidency. So they gathered together in this movement, the Kafaya movement. So this is uh, seven years before the what we think of formally as the revolution. The April 6th movement was a student movement that formed in 2008, and they were basically a group that uh, formed in solidarity with the laborers on strike. There was a huge countrywide strike called for April 6th of 2008. That's how they got their name. And these were students who, who supported the laborers on strike. They eventually went on to become some of the primary leaders of the protests in 2011. And they still um, are active as much as they can be, although the group has been outlawed and many of its leaders are in prison. So all of that long journey of the revolution that started before 2011 led up to this pinnacle moment of February 11, 2011 in Tahrir Square. It was one of the best moments of my life experiencing this when finally they achieved what they thought was the impossible, the removal, removal of President Hosni Mubarak. Almost immediately, the counter-revolution began. And here we see the process continuing. In 2011-2012, the counter-revolution intensified particularly uh, under the military rule, otherwise known as SCAF, the Supreme Council of Armed Forces. They ruled in this period for an entire year with the support of state security and police forces under the, um, under the directorship of the Ministry of the Interior. So what does the counter-revolution consist of from 2011 to 2012? Mainly perpetrating state violence against protesters, sowing sectarianism in society, and sowing fears of terrorism. So obviously perpetrating uh, state violence against protesters, that's to keep the protesters down, to keep pe try to keep people off the streets. The second, the sowing of sectarianism, I think it's really important for us in the United States, There's, there tends to be this, uh, this uh, misunderstanding that sectarianism in the Middle East is the result of centuries-old hatreds uh, between, for example, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, um, and that somehow they all innately have some inherent essence that makes them hate each other. When actually scholars of sectarianism are able to show that it is a result of political and economic strife, usually. And so in this case, the, the military followed in the footsteps of the Mubarak government in sowing sectarianism in society as a kind of divide and rule strategy. And sowing fears of terrorism. Um, the military did this primarily to, to paint all of their Islamist opposition as terrorists and to convince Egyptians that a strong military state would be better than having Islamic terrorists uh, running around the country. So we'll talk about a little bit more about what that means. I want to show you a, a political cartoon from the period. Now this could be considered a piece of revolutionary political cartoon because it highlights the extent to which or how the military was sowing the seeds of sectarianism. Here you have uh, military men whispering in the ears of a, of a Christian and a Muslim like, we've got your back, it's the other ones who are your enemy. Now this was occurring at a time when the military, for example, in the fall of 2011, um, tried to clamp down on a demonstration of thousands of Coptic Christians who were demanding for the removal of restrictive laws that are on the books in Egypt uh, for building churches. And the military, in one night, actually ended up killing 27 Coptic Christians and using the media um, to blame the Christians themselves, that they were some sort of fifth column in Egyptian society that was not committed to the revolution. Meanwhile, uh, they were spreading um, rumors about the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamist groups that they were just terrorists, that they had nothing else uh, to their political platform. Um, and so making the two groups very suspicious of each other. other another protest happened that was um, a, a prime example of state violence in the winter of 2011, and that resulted in um, an attack on the protesters that became internationally known as the Blue Bra Incident. I don't know if many of you heard of this, but there were essentially a group of protesters who went to the parliament building to reject the military's appointment of a Mubarak era uh, official as the new prime minister. And the military sent out its police, beat up the protesters, including a woman who was disrobed and kicked repeatedly on the chest. Um, this incident made international press. Um, uh, there were huge demonstrations by Egyptians after it. 
And here you can see one of the demonstrators holding a sign, and it says um, in Arabic, Tantawi, that's the he, he was the general and uh, head of SCAF, Tantawi, get your dogs off of me. So this, not just her, but off of us, off of me, off of all of us. So as you see the counter-revolutionary activities and the state violence, you also see resistance to it. You also see resistance to it moving into 2012. Um, so another uh, group that was very ch much challenging the system, in addition to the Coptic Christian activists and the Islamist activists, were the ultras. These, this is a collective of soccer fans numbering in the thousands. It's like a soccer club. And they are very politicized. They are linked to politicized soccer clubs in Europe and other places, actually. And they played a very big role in the protest in 2011 in Tahrir Square. But even before that, they'd always been at loggerheads with state security forces, who they said at their games always harassed them, intimidated them, imprisoned them, beat them up, would drag them into the police station, etc. cetera. So there had been a long-standing rivalry between them. So now the military is in power. It's January 2012. And what happened was that in a soccer stadium in Port Said at a game, Port Said's a city on the Suez Canal, at a game, some people from outside came in, locked the doors, and murdered over 70 soccer fans from the ultras with machetes. This was one of the biggest soccer massacres in history. The soccer fans think that they were thugs paid by the government, by the military as retribution for their resistance to the military and state security all of these years and their primary role in Tahrir Square. In reaction to this massacre, they did a bunch of graffiti and they also staged a bunch of protests. Again, counter-revolution brings revolutionary action with it. So I'll show you a little clip of one of the protests. The translation I didn't do, it's not great, but it'll give you an idea of what they're chanting. <laughs> a number of segments of society that were being um, attacked literally and figuratively by the military regime in power in 2011 and 2012, there was great impetus to get someone else in the presidency. And so in June 2012, Egyptians elected a new president, Mohamed Morsi, who was formerly a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He resigned from the Brotherhood in order to run for president. And he was elected by the majority of Egyptians essentially because he was not the other candidate. The other candidate was a former member of the Mubarak regime. And so the experience of a year of military rule and the attempt of the military to regime to bring back uh, Mubarak players led people to vote for the alternative. Now, Morsi also had a lot of supporters, um, people who were members of the Muslim Brotherhood or who were um, fond of the Muslim Brotherhood, who for years had been providing some basic social services as the government kind of retreated from providing those to the citizens. And so a lot of people were convinced that perhaps this would be an alternative vision. Here he is in Tahrir Square the day he was elected president, famously holding up his hands and saying, I'm not wearing a bulletproof jacket you know, I trust you people and I'm your, I'm your new leader. So the square filled again. 
with people of all different types in Egyptian society, not just Muslim Brotherhood supporters. And it was another moment that might be termed revolutionary in a sense that people had thought that this might, this might be the answer. This might be the answer to bring them bread, freedom, and social justice. <clears throat> But just at this moment that we might consider somewhat revolutionary, and it felt that way in Tahrir Square in the celebration of Morsi, the next day at his inauguration, here he is, flanked by who? The military, right? Who, for the next year, he was in loggerheads with, who constrained almost everything he tried to do, and he dealt, uh, underestimated the degree to which that constraint was going to happen, and completely messed up any kind of um, proper presidential program that he had claimed he was going to enact. And you can see, even in this picture, what the future is going to be. Standing two people to his Morsi's right is General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who would eventually remove Morsi from power and become elected as Egypt's current president. After a year of rule, Egyptians went to the streets again in what might be called a revolutionary moment. Or can it? It's something that's part of the long process. So on June 30th, 2013, millions went to Tahrir Square again, demanding that Morsi abdicate, demanding that Morsi leave office, that he was such a failure. This was, we don't know the statistics exactly, if it was the majority of Egyptians or not, but certainly the square was full, and there were protests in other parts of the country as well against Morsi. A few days later, General Sisi appeared on television and announced that the military would take over and Morsi was no longer president and Morsi was arrested. Was it a revolution or was it a coup? Or was it a coup-volution, <laughs> as some people call it? Well, it was a coup. If a definition of a coup is the military taking a president out of office and putting itself in power, that's a coup. So was the removal of Mubarak then, right? That was a revolution, and I want to suggest that this was also felt to many people very revolutionary as well. Many supporters of this movement against Morsi argue that they are the ones that demanded and pushed the military into removing him. But it was also a coup of a democratically elected president. So I know many in the United States, uh, the, there was a co the time, cover of Time magazine that month said, Egypt, Egyptians, world's best protesters, world's worst Democrats. So why did Egyptians go to the streets? Although I can think of presidents in American history that Americans might have gone to the streets to try and get out of office early as well. Why did people so much oppose Morsi? Well, he didn't do anything to address, or enough, or really hardly anything, to address those three demands of the revolution, bread, freedom, and social justice. I took this photo of a newly applied graffiti in December 2012, six months into Morsi's rule. It says in Arabic, where is the bread? And I talked to this shoe sign salesman, and I said, so who did that graffiti? He goes, I don't know, but I'd like to sit under it, because I'd like to know where my bread is. <laughs> there were, in the Morsi era, over 2,000 social and political protests. Okay, now, from 20, 2006 to 2011, there were 3,000. Here you have, in one year, 2,000. So protests over the economy, labor strikes, et cetera, were increasing in the Morsi era, because very, people felt that very little was being done. We think about freedom. People felt that, the, that Morsi was not really committed to freedom in many ways. And it's true, the evidence bears it out. He embarked on a constitution writing process to write the new constitution, and he and Islamist groups systematically sidelined all of the other players to the constitutional process, women's groups, Christian groups, uh, the revolutionary youth. So in the end, it turned out to be an Islamist constitution, which does not represent the majority of Egyptian society. He also, as part of this process, uh, as some of you may recall, issued an executive order putting him essentially above the law. Now, it was an attempt to contain the judiciary, who he thought was sort of in cahoots still with Mubarak, and to get the Constitution uh, passed. But it still was widely seen as an abuse of presidential power. So protests erupted in December 2012. They always seemed to erupt when I was there, which was how I got <laughs> photos of it. And here you can see they're portraying him as a pharaoh, like a dictator, and, the, and it says in Arabic, down with the, the pharaoh president. So these are massive protests outside of the presidential palace um, that occurred in December of 2012. Things were getting so bad in terms of bread, freedom, and social justice that 
Egyptians embarked on a campaign in the spring of 2013 to get him removed. This was the Rebel Campaign, or Tamarud Campaign. Now, we can think of this as also part of the revolutionary process, part of the journey. Hundreds of Egyptians fanned out across cities and the countryside in Egypt to gather signatures, de demanding that Morsi step down. They gathered 22 million signatures. Okay, that's huge. These are everyday people going out. I was also there, actually, in May 2013, when the campaign really began, and could see people in the subways, oh, would you please sign, you know, uh, in coffee shops, in restaurants. People were working hard for this rebel campaign. Was it revolutionary or was it counter-revolutionary? Subsequently found out that some of the leaders of this campaign were in cahoots and talking to military all along. <clears throat> so we have to think about actions as revolutionary and co potentially counter-revolutionary at the same time. Of course, the military wanted Morsi out of power, and they succeeded. They succeeded, um, and since August 2013 until now, the counter-revolution has really intensified. We see this in control of the press, state violence, attempts to control public space through a new protest law, and attempts to constrain civil society through an NGO law. I'll talk about the press control in Q&A if you'd like, but I'll start with state violence. <clears throat> in another um, example of the process moving and people not sitting down and taking what the government was going to do, no matter what it did, the supporters of President, former President, now deposed President Morsi, decided to have a sit-in in Rabah Square in Cairo. This was last, a year ago, August, July and August of 2013. From their perspective, their president was democratically elected. How come the military can just take them out, right? So they staged a sit-in. After a couple weeks of negotiations between the military and leaders of the Brotherhood, in which neither were very good parties, the military just decided it was going to disperse the sit-in. And it did so on August 14th, 2013. Nearly 1,000 people were killed. It was the largest number of people killed in a single day in the modern Middle Eastern history. And this includes Syria and all of the barbarity of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. They claimed, the military claimed, that these supporters of Morsi were terrorists, right? Morsi and the Brotherhood, they're all terrorists. Several independent human rights groups, including Human Rights Watch, did an investigation and found out that there were actually only 30 weapons at the protest site where there were hundreds of thousands of people. Most of these were makeshift weapons. They were armed, but they weren't armed to go attack a bunch of people, and they claimed that they were acting in self-defense. <clears throat> Some analysts actually say that the military actually uh, confirmed that there were very few weapons there before the attack so that they would lose less of their people, although the military did lose people in that. So to justify it, they kept the, 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 the military regime back in power, embarked on an anti-terrorism campaign. Pretty soon after that massacre, billboards appeared all over Cairo, Egypt saying Egypt fights terrorism. <clears throat> the idea being that, you know, we needed to kill a thousand people because they're terrorists and we need to stay in power because you're at risk of terrorism. This is actually a photo of my son that the military stole off the internet uh, or off of Facebook where uh, a friend of mine had put it up. It was a photo of him in Tahrir Square in 2011 celebrating the, uh, the downfall of Mubarak. So it gives you a sense of that the military is not really respecting many personal <laughs> rights, right? <laughs> Including the right of parents to images of their child. <clears throat> Despite this intensification, the revolutionary process continues. It's very small, the process continues. Revolutionary activities are very small and contained right now, but they are still continuing. This is despite a protest law, which was passed uh, by the government. There is no government, it was the military issued it a year ago. This protest law says that for any gathering over 10 people, you need to have government permission. So we're in jail right now. <laughs> okay, you need to have government permission and that has to be uh, requested at least three days in advance. For any gathering that is deemed to be a, wait, let me get this right, a threat to public order, the secret police can close it down without due process. So a threat to public order, that can be defined pretty broadly, correct? 
Um, there are no uh, demonstrations allowed at places of worship. This is an attempt to crack down on demonstrations that would often emerge out of the mosques on Fridays. And you can't wear masks or cover your face at any demonstration. Right? And there's heavy fines or imprisonment for whoever violates this law. Some people, well, a lot of people have been imprisoned, but protests still continue. We have seen a number of labor strikes and sit-ins uh, since last August, since the military has been in power, and since Sisi was elected president in, uh, in May. There have been strikes of textile workers, steel workers, postal workers, bus drivers, pretty much the entire city of Suez, and the security forces themselves have struck for higher wages. So clearly, there's a lot of unrest around uh, workplace conditions and um, wages, what would give someone access to bread and social justice. Um, there have also been student protests. So the government um, this year delayed the opening of, of schools and colleges until basically last week, saying that they were delaying it because of threats of protests. They're really putting in a massive security apparatus and stalling it at the doors uh, of all of the major universities. So they finally opened the universities about 10 days ago. And pretty much every day since then, there have been massive student protests. These are protests by, the government says it's all Muslim Brotherhood students and they're terrorists and we need to arrest them. However, when you look at the protest videos and you talk to analysts on the ground, you can see that some of the students are Muslim Brotherhood supporters who want more C back who they believe to be their president. A number of them, a great number of them, are ultra soccer fans who don't really have anything to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. And then an even larger number of them are just students who are very upset at the way that the military has tried to control operations within the universities by instituting a new set of, or proposing, new sets of stipulations. So not just the security apparatus at the doors, but also uh, um, control over the formation of student clubs, that you have to have military approval to form a student organization, um, to replace all the academic deans with military generals, for example, um, and to surveil students um, on campus and to arrest them for any political activity, including wearing a shirt with any political message on it. So students from a variety of political perspectives or associations have protested. And I'll show you just a clip of these protests. There's no translation, but you'll get a sense of the difference. to do this. These students are being attacked by tear, with tear gas. Many of them are being arrested. By the government's own figures, six, they have taken in 16,000 political prisoners in the past year. That's the government figure, <laughs> okay? 16,000 political prisoners, counter-revolution. What are these prisoners doing? Well, many of them are going on hunger strike. Hunger strikes have emerged as a major kind of revolutionary activity to protest arbitrary detention, detention without charge, detention without evidence, as well as torture in police and military prisons and installations. This is perhaps the most famous hunger striker. He's American. He's got both Egyptian and American citizenship. His name is Mohammed Sultan. He graduated a couple years ago from Ohio State University. Went back to Egypt because his mother was suffering from cancer. His father was involved in the Muslim Brotherhood. He became a supporter of Morsi, was really shocked that Morsi was taken out of power by the military, went to Rabah Square, was part of the protest there, was arrested in August 2013, 
proceeded to be beaten up in the police station um, and in the prison by more than, a, his accounting, more than 100 uh, officers. To this date, no evidence has been presented against him. So this is over a year now, no evidence has been presented against him and his trial keeps getting postponed. In fact, uh, the judge, uh, they, they met uh, last Wednesday and they, pro they po postponed it again until I think November 5th. This is what he looks like now. President Obama has tried to intercede. The government just said, we don't take orders from anyone. There are, by many estimates, at least 200 hunger strikers in Egyptian prisons now, and there are hundreds more outside the prison, many of them actually journalists in the media, who are striking in solidarity. That's also because many uh, journalists have been targeted by the military regime. What I want to say to you, though, is they can't, the state cannot make him eat, although I suppose they could if they held him down, right? But his case is uh, evidence of continuing uh, revolutionary activity, reminding the public of what they're facing. And then finally, there's been a restrictive NGO law um, that's been proposed and a really draconian NGO law that's, that's currently being applied. Just to make matters simple, basically the, the military, uh, the state, the government, CC, is trying to crack down on civil society. This NGO law basically says that the government can close or deny licenses to groups deemed a threat to national unity. So that is, again, very broad. Um, it has, enforces very crippling restrictions on NGOs that take foreign funding. And any NGO that kind of violates some of these restrictions and stipulations can have its assets seized by the state and closed. Here's a photo of an NGO that I work with. It's an arts and cultural NGO for youth in Cairo. In the past couple months, uh, the government has brought a number of court cases against it, charging it with dubious things like operating an NGO in a residential neighborhood or um, taking foreign funding without approval from the state. They get foreign funding from a European cultural foundation. The state actually sent in a, a winch and destroyed that wall one day, but they're not taking it laying down. The children and their parents and the NGO workers all have made several trips to uh, the, the police chief's office, the governor of Cairo's office, um, and he has said that he actually did some promises that he will, he will ease the number of court cases that are against him. It's not much, but they are not taking it lying down. So to conclude, I propose to you that there's no going back. And there's little glimmers of activity despite the strength of the counter-revolution in this moment of an ebb. And I think there's going to be a flow soon. There's no going back because you can't erase the memory of millions, especially of the younger generation, of the successes of 2011. There's no going back because precedents have been set and now people know that they can go to their governor to complain. They know that they can you know, protest in public space, whether it's ultras or students um, or labor workers to strike. There are precedents that have been set that if we occupy public space, we, our voices can be heard. There's no going back because there is a focus slogan bread, freedom, and social justice that Egyptians, no matter where they lie on the political spectrum, believe in, right? And there's no going back because those things have not been achieved. There hasn't been hardly any progress towards addressing uh, the discontent at the lack of bread, freedom, and social justice in Egypt. And I'd like to end with a quote on the concept of revolution by an Egyptian anthropologist, Reem Saad. She says, we use the term revolution to denote a process that is far from over. It is a mantra that motivates us to continue our efforts. In this sense, the term revolution does not describe past events, but signifies an intention and a goal. And I'd like to add that the term revolution signifies a journey, a journey that for Egyptians is still not over. Thank you. Be happy to take any questions. What do you have to do? What do you have to do to get visas to go back? I mean, if they find out about all of us here in your presentation and so on, it could be a problem. Or exactly how does that you know, stand? 
it, it appears that they still don't have um, a very comprehensive apparatus at the airport. Some people are not allowed back in and then some people slip in. Some people are not allowed out and then other people slip out. Um, I haven't had any problems yet, although I will say that in preparing for this talk, I did think that there might be someone from the Egyptian consulate here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, uh, they, um, you know, the Egyptian government wants tourism, right? That's the bedrock of their economy. And so they are very, very welcoming of foreigners, no matter what they might say about the Americans supporting Morsi or, you know, messing up politics in Syria, et cetera. They're very welcoming at the airport to foreigners. Um, it's Egyptians who have more difficult going in and out if they are involved in politics. Or, or foreign sort of uh, members of ma major um, news organizations or like the Human Rights Watch or something like that. If I could, I'd like to have you project into the future a little bit. Uh, revolution is uh, one thing, but w how do you see things coalescing into enough of a political force where there is some opposing entity that can, in effect, rule? I mean, the only organized, I don't know to what extent the Muslim Brotherhood has been effectively destroyed, and I guess <coughs> it ha I suppose it hasn't, but the problem was it was the only really organized political entity and therefore dominated those mm -hmm. elections. Absolutely. That's the, really the main problem, is there's no organized... Uh, yeah, the okay, the question is uh, to ask me to project in the future to, to address the problem of there being no organized political force uh, aside from, you know, the former regime, the military, etc., and the Muslim Brotherhood. Like, what is the, the, the revolutionary force that would be, for example, a political party, right, or, or a set of institutions that could change the, change the system? This, you've actually put your finger on the main problem right now. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood has been, I don't think they've been effectively destroyed. Um, they're, they're sitting in exile planning a lot of things, perhaps some of these bombings, um, the military wing anyway. Not sure, you know, the, the jury's out on that still. Um, but uh, the left has, it's, it's a problem because since the Mubarak era, liberals and leftists have been told and they have believed that they need to support a strong military in order to avoid Islamist uh, rule or Islamist influence in their society. And so what we need is um, a, a period in which that threat no longer is, is present or in which it becomes so clear that this kind of uh, devil's bargain with the military is not going to work out. I will say that, um, that the, the youth groups um, are still very active. They are gathering resources. They are involved in various organizing, underground organizing activities now. It doesn't look very promising, but I think that, you know, these are still people in their 20s and 30s. Um, you know, they have some relations with um, some of the opposition parties that are very small and influ uninfluential right now that they're trying to build on and create a, a coalition, um, but that's still a work in progress. If there's any indication of, of, of the potential of that, though, I think we can see that in the first round of elections in the Morsi, the election that Morsi was elected in. In the first round, there were six candidates, four of whom were from center left, center liberal left parties. Between those four, they got the majority of the votes. And the brotherhood and the regime got the minority of the votes, right, if you, if you sort of divided them that way. So there actually is a lot of broad social support for an opposition force were it to organize and, and emerge, but that remains the main problem. Thank you. Realizing that democracy is not just a box, we're realizing that some of the worst rulers in the world were elected like Hitler, was elected through the box. So was Hamas in Gaza, so was Chavez, so with many other rulers. Right. Realizing that the American Revolution took so many years and the founders killed each other in duels. And the French Revolution took about 10 years and we had emperor coming back. Mm -hmm. So realizing that Egypt does not function in vacuum, that it's surrounded by local, regional, mm -hmm. and global powers and events, realizing that what's going in Egypt right now is an attempt to have stability to go forward versus what we call democracy through the box. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on what do you think of that? And one more question is, 
<laughs> um, I read quite a bit, and I always find the discrepancy between uh, Wall Street Journal and New York Times. The only thing they agreed upon in the last year or so, David Kirkpatrick, I'm sure you know him, and the others from Wall Street Journal, they agree that this was a coup, not a revolution. Whatever the name is, does it really matter? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, okay, so the first question was, was essentially a statement about how Egypt is not operating in a vacuum, but has, you know, is influenced by and attempting to influence various dynamics and processes, both regionally within the Middle East, as well as internationally, um, namely, probably with the reference to the United States and, and Europe. And yes, I could, I could talk for another three hours on that topic. Um, I don't quite know where to uh, address it except to say that uh, the military is aiming for stability, as the gentleman said, mainly stability for itself, okay? And so stability for itself means that we'll take certain positions in relationship to conflicts in the Middle East that do not embroil it in any destabilizing factor, right? So for example, with the war in Gaza this past summer, the Egyptian military uh, abided by the Camp David Accords and, and actually did not enter that conflict on behalf of the Palestinians, which one might expect. This is because Egypt, like Israel, sees Hamas uh, and in general the Palestinian national movement as threatening to its own stability. Right, so there are a number of things that influence all of this. I will also say that many Egyptians voted for Sisi because they were afraid that Egypt would turn into Syria, okay? So stability has become a kind of discourse used by the military and by many Egyptians to support the status quo for the time being. But I will say, I just got back a couple weeks ago, that in discussions with Egyptians, people are saying, okay, th those who support Sisi or voted for Sisi are saying, okay, we voted him because we wanted stability, but we're not going to forget about bread freedom and social justice. And so we're, it's, a, it's a theme of watchful waiting. Watchful waiting, I would say, among the CC supporters. Um, the second question I, oh, was it a coup or a revolution and does it matter? Uh, you know, I guess in the end it doesn't because the situation is the way it was. But I think that what I've, what I've been trying to suggest to you is that Revolutionary activities can often have at their, at, at, as part of them a counter-revolution, and the, and the opposite is true as well. Um, but I don't think that the people could have taken Morsi out without the military, and the military couldn't have taken Morsi out without the people. So. Hi. Um, I have a question about gender, um, and maybe it's multi-headed. Um, I seem to remember in the early days of Tahrir, Tahrir Square that there were young sex women who were revolutionary and had some leadership roles and you don't see just you don't hear about them anymore and um, I also wondered how you are perceived mm -hmm. and um, your name is it my Judar is up I mean your name is a Jew is a Jewish name to me I don't know if you're Jewish or not but I don't know how you present yourself mm -hmm. and what you wear mm -hmm. and how that how that goes. Sure. So the general question is about gender. Uh, first, about where are the women, are the women leaders? Um, yes, there were a lot of women leaders in Tahrir. Women were, you know, 30 to 50 percent of the protesters in Tahrir at any visit I made. Um, you mentioned there were secular women leaders. Yes, there were, but there were also Islamist and Coptic Christian uh, activist women leaders as well. So it's not always helpful to say secular versus religious. In, in terms of analyzing what was going on in the initial 18 days, because everyone was really in it together. Um, and those, those women still have, um, you know, they're, they're actually still very politically active. The reason we don't hear about them is I guess it's not like fun in the press anymore. To, I mean, the American press doesn't pick up these stories. They're just focusing sort of on violence right now, right? And bombings and things like that. Not focusing on the hard work that people are doing on the ground. I will say that the state, um, has targeted women just as much as men, if not more. So the military, uh, right after the 18 days, um, arrested a bunch of female protesters more from the secular side and gave them forced virginity tests. Um, as you saw from the Blue Bra incident, there's targeting of women protesters, beating them up. A number of Muslim Brotherhood women protesters in Alexandria last year were arrested and are still being detained, some say tortured. So uh, like many uh, states, 
the violence that is enacted on the population is gendered. This is not specific to the Middle East. As for my own, there was a question about my own position in Egyptian society when I, when I go. Um, you know, it varies. It depends sort of on how people view Americans um, at, at, at any particular time. Um, so right now, Americans are not too popular because we're criticizing Sisi. Um, you know, during, um, during the Muslim Brotherhood era, it was, it was okay. But generally, people distinguish between a person and their government. Generally, Egyptians are quite generous and hospitable that way. As for the Judar, my name doesn't code as Jewish there, so that never gets picked up. <laughs> <laughs> People don't really have the names memorized. <laughs> um, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, when we were perceiving that in the press, it sounded negative because they were out of power and forbidden for so many years. But uh, then they got back, and then it sounded like they were taking over pretty much. And now they're outlawed again, I think. So could you give your opinion on that? Give my opinion on how they've come into popularity and out of popularity? Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, just to one more question related to gender. I was asked what I wear when I'm there. I get this question a lot. Um, I wear what I, you know, I dress pretty, you know, modestly, so I'll, I will not have short sleeves or a short skirt, but other than that, I dress how I would dress, like, right now. Um, there's not an, an expectation in Egypt that someone would dress uh, not like how they usually dress. So, for example, people who aren't Muslim aren't expected to dress like Muslims. Um, there's many women who don't cover their hair in Egypt. Uh, Coptic Christians are 12% of the population, for example. Not all Muslims cover their hair. So basically, I wear what I wear here, just not dressing like the 20-year-olds we see out on this campus. <laughs> like most of us who just dress modestly um, in the American sense. OK, so re regarding, to the, regarding the Muslim Brotherhood, are they a force for good or bad? I mean, I think that um, you know the Muslim Brotherhood became popular because they were running free medical clinics, giving away free school supplies. Uh, giving away uh, food to the poor for many, many years. I mean, they worked very, very hard. They gave up terrorism. They gave up violence in the 1950s. And from that point until recently, when they appear to have picked up violence again, they were primarily a social services organization, right? So they got a lot of popularity, especially in the Delta region of Egypt. Um, but their rule was such a failure that People just said, you know, you were so good at organizing blood drives. What happened to you when you took over, you know, the presidency? They, they were unprepared for high-level politics, unable to build coalitions. All of the ABCs of, of politics at the higher level. Um, and so that's why the people revolted against them. Isn't it true that uh, Sisi trained in the United States at the War co uh, College mm -hmm. and that uh, we are still giving him a lot of military mm -hmm. equipment? Mm -hmm. And so that we are kind of responsible mm -hmm. for all of these killings that the military is mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And President Carter uh, criticized our policy mm -hmm. last week on that. And also, isn't this partly uh, religious, the second part, because Saudi Arabia and Israel mm -hmm. support him uh, as against the uh, mm -hmm. Shiites? So that we have these two forces that are really kind of very discouraging for mm -hmm. Egypt, I would think, mm -hmm. for a future of democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And in a way, your question responds to the other question about the external forces uh, that, are, that are shaping the situation in Egypt. Obviously, you know, the, the U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East is, is greatly shaping the situation in the sense that, you know, Israel gets the most amount of foreign military aid from the United States. Uh, over, you know, every year for the past 30 years, and then Egypt is number two. And protesters will, will show you, they'll show tear gas canisters made in the USA. There's a company in Pennsylvania. The U.S. Uh, government ships them, you know, the tear gas um, purchased from this company, um, as well as all of the military armor. So, yes, um, the Egyptian, the U.S. government and the Egyptian military have been tight for many years, although analysts are seeing some significant cracks appearing as CC appeals to the Chinese, to the Russians, um, now for, for certain kinds of foreign aid. So I think we're, we're in a beginning of a period where things are actually shifting. The role of the Gulf states is another huge element. I mean, you could say it's religious, that it's Shia versus Sunni, but it's also really about economic interests. 
the Saudis and the Israelis and the Egyptians all have an interest in maintaining themselves as the big players in the region and not uh, for Saudi and Egypt not really having democracy in those places and Israel, uh, you know, continuing the occupation of, of the West Bank and Gaza. And so the three of them, you know, are in agreement over that. So that's an alliance that doesn't support forces of democracy for sure. This will be your last question. Okay. You spoke about a lot of uh, continuing activity in the universities. And I was wondering, uh, how is the American University of Cairo either viewed or disrupted or um, used, uh, perhaps, by the uh, government? Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it's Cairo Review, the magazine, the journal that they're now uh, publishing. Mm -hmm. How is that being affected, do you think, mm -hmm. or choosing to affect mm -hmm. uh, political policy? Or movement. Right. Well, it's a complicated question regarding the American University in Cairo. It's a private institution, um, but does have to abide by laws of the Egyptian state. It has a very active student movement. There are protests there um, against the, the general sort of military regime, but also a lot of protest students protesting for um, workers, students' rights and workers' rights, workers in the university, like janitors and things like that. So it's got a very active uh, student movement. But that said, it does train the elite of society. It costs a lot of money to go there. They do have some scholarships, but it costs a lot of money to go there. So it's training uh, the business and, and, in some cases, military elites of society. And so those people have interests some t in some parts of the system continuing. Um, so it does play a role in the kind of social reproduction of the system. It came under a lot of criticism in the 18 days because at, uh, it has some buildings on Tahrir Square. And there was a rumor, it has not completely been substantiated, um, although I don't find it particularly, um, you know, something that we shouldn't believe, that, the, the, that snipers, military snipers were placed on the roofs of the university and were shooting at protesters. Um, the provost denied that, but there's people that claim they have video of that. Um, it's viewed by Egyptians, many Egyptians of the, of the middle and lower classes as kind of, you know, just this evidence of, of American influence in Egyptian society, viewed with some suspicion, not just because it's, you know, American, but also because it's uh, where the wealthy go to college. Um, and in that way, it's viewed uh, like, like the American embassy in terms of its um, actual social space and the buildings itself. But the students there are, like students everywhere, you know, rearing to go, you know, they, they engage in a lot of protests there. Um, and the university administration has actually clamped down on them several times. Um, the faculty support the students, but the administration has not supported those protests. The Cairo Review, it's a, it's a great journal. It's still being published. So. Thank you very much for coming.